I reckon that you all know this guy by now. Almost every session here at the Radio Days has been beginning setting out with this guy from Radio Analyzer. Does anyone know his name? No. Okay, we'll leave that for later. Now, I, I reckon you've been through sessions about the FM switch off in Norway, about uh, creative management, about marketing, about uh, talking speakers, about smart speakers, etc. Uh, but really, there hasn't been very much about journalism. This session is going to uh, make up for that. This session is about journalism, it's about fact-checking. And there's something about fact-checking that to me is a bit of a paradox. That is that we talk about fact-checking as something unique, as something really maybe even special, and at the same time, fact-checking is just really the basics, the ABC of journalism. Fact-checking is really just making sure that the way you represent reality is actually truthful, and that you do it in a truthful mm. way or in a truthful manner. When I launched a fact-checking radio program in Denmark back in 2011, um, what I found was that there was absolutely or very few tools to, to do fact-checking. All we could find at that time was a four-minute video on YouTube uh, produced by PolitiFact in the United States, which was a very basic introduction as to as to how to fact check. Since then, we've gone through uh, the so-called post-truth era with Paul Ryan, Donald Trump, uh, social media explosion, deep fakes, and, and many other phenomena, uh, which altogether significantly has increased awareness of how important it is to check facts before you put them on air. Um, and in that range of time or in that period, there's also been an increased development of specific tools, different tools, in order to actually work with fact-checking. And it is those tools and all those different tools that are available in the market that we're going to talk about today. And to do that, we have Vincent Ryan from uh, Google News Lab in London. Please welcome Vincent. He will talk to you in a little while, but before we do that, let's uh, hear from Wilfred Runde, who is head of innovations at the Deutsche Welle in Germany, which is basically Germany's uh, world service. Wilfried. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you, Thomas. Hello and welcome. Uh, Thomas promised you <coughs> journalism and, uh, and fact-checking, and I will try to live up to that, that promise because I want to make that connection and first may remind us all how important that very basic... Um, journalistic feature uh, is more important than ever. So, first, in case you are in the unlikely event here that you're not one of the 155 million people we reach throughout the world on a weekly basis, in 2017, Deutsche Welle is Germany's international public broadcaster. It's a global information provider. Uh, by now, we have content in 30 languages, and of course, this content is on, uh, on all platforms. Still, radio is radio broadcasting is also what we're doing, but it has uh, there has been shift towards online, social, and for audio um, in in the direction of, of podcasting, of course. So, what have I prepared for you? It's uh, basically three uh, sections. We're first going to talk um, about a bit of tension that arised lately around around the topic. Then, and this is say the journalistic part in here, what are the journalistic challenges, what has changed, and then the final, I'll introduce you to a tool that we developed, actually with a bit of help from Google's Digital News Initiative. It's a verification platform. I will show you the features briefly, but already tell you right now as a disclaimer, it's not a full-blown demo. I will show you the key features, but I'm here in case you want to get in touch and uh, get uh, a more in-depth look on truly. Okay, starting with tension. Um, there is and was tension around the F word, which is now fake news. And um, I mean, th this is the toughest condemnation that you can get for producing fake news. Yeah? You're compared to the snake, to the original sin here. And I say that, is, that was the first uh, fake news that was ever produced or by this it came into the, into the world. 
So even the Pope is concerned about fake news. But what I try to get your attention to is rather not the Trump and Paul Ryan and Kellyanne Conway kind of fake news ecosystem that's just, say, a vanity, a vanity fair for uh, the first world. In developing countries, this is true for many years, and it has been underreported and not yet um, is fully exposed to the world. But this is a true sentence here from the Columbia Journalism uh, Review. Examples only from the past <coughs> 10 days. Uh, here is Myanmar. Seven days ago, ago the UN uh, Special Committee released its report on the Rohingya crisis and the role Facebook played in that crisis. And you see the result here. It couldn't be, it couldn't be clearer. Uh, it couldn't be clearer that there is responsibility for these platforms and that they're doing a great deal of damage, especially in these countries where media literacy is low, where people have data plans for their smartphones that only allow them access to, to Facebook, which is the case in, uh, in Africa and in, in many countries. And in Myanmar, the internet basically is Facebook. So I won't go into detail here. I have many more uh, examples. Go look this up. Seven days ago, there, is a, there was this special report, and it's devastating. Sri Lanka. That's only like roughly 10 days ago um, when, on, again, on, uh, on Facebook, there was a rumor that a Muslim chef in the community of Kandy mixed contraceptives into Buddhist meals. Huh? That's a total... Uh, I mean, how, how big a lie can you tell? But still, this was believed. There was an incident involving a Muslim uh, bus driver that had an accident, and because there was this tension already in that community, this is what it resulted in. An eight days full state emergency, they shut down um, Facebook, Instagram, and WhatsApp for, for that time, so in order not more misinformation could be, could be spread. This is still kind of in a, in a kind of yellow alert phase there, tracking down the origins and investigating, but yet another example. Same region, different platform. Here's India. In India, it's a video market now because of cheap data plans, cheap video distribution. So here is uh, a snapshot from a, from a tweet stating that every single video on a trending video topics list is spreading misinformation and falsehood. So again, different platform, I think Facebook took many beatings over the past <laughs> weeks, uh, but there are responsibilities. And there's also a bit of responsibility with Google and YouTube to do something about it, because it is a matter of life and death in these, in these countries. And those are just three examples from the past few weeks. And here is still my, uh, my favorite impact of fake news uh, example from December 2016. This is when there was um, a false tweet that was taken for granted by the Pakistani um, Minister of De Defense and he immediately issued a nuclear threat towards Israel because the fake tweet was supposed to come from the Israeli Defense Minister. So if you can get that with one tweet, how important is verification to us as journalists and media organizations? And this is where we are at the core. This is about the truth. Huh? We'll those old enough always hear this uh, Jack Nicholson voice in your head, you can't handle the truth. Can we handle the truth? I think that's a, a core question here. Uh, this, just as an entertaining bit, is not a fake. <laughs> this is a, a picture taken by my daughter in China. It's a bit of lost in translation, but I think it, it, it's uh, a very, very good symbol of, yes, we all should be careful about the truth from both angles, from all angles. And again, it's, it's true, it's on a mountain near Beijing. Um, and here, more on the truth. So what, what's the situation of the truth in different countries? And I'm from, from Germany, and this is not a test for your German language skills, but it just if you're not colorblind. If you're not colorblind, you would see seven out of ten red paragraphs in, in there. And this is the ten most shared and interacted with articles about Angela Merkel from 2017. 
on Facebook out of these 10 articles, again, most interacted, most shared, seven are outright false, they're outright false, two are op-eds, and only one is true. Now, think about that for a moment. What, what is out there? What are people receiving in those filter bubbles? Same, just another example, as we are on Angela Merkel, this is a widely shared um, myth that she did a selfie with the terrorist involved in the Paris ter terrorist attacks, not true at all. Um, and here, as a reminder, this is what we strive to do. This is what journalism should be, as of Carl Bernstein, Watergate uh, legacy. But how to do that in the reality that we are facing now with all these distorted uh, truths and uh, what we're facing instead, if we're not doing it right, if we fall for misinformation, um, and also the fake news uh, allegations are coming from the same direction, we are now liars press if we don't live up to that. So that finally brings us to breaking news situation. This is where, this is like war. This is where the truth gets lost within, within seconds, and all of these towns that could have added more and more diverse. Um, the moment that incidents broke loose, the truth was lost. Some examples, this is after the Manchester Ariana Grande uh, concert, and in here you see an, uh, yeah, a stunning example of if you don't do verification, what do you do? You spread these lies and evoke panic in local communities. Here there was a false tweet saying, there, is a, there are attackers, the attackers are now in that hospital, and 13,000 or 14,000 chairs in a small community is a lot. So the Daily Mail jumped for that, didn't verify that, broke out, so the police, the police finally had to correct it. This is on your left side, on your right side, you see uh, a standard meme in breaking news situations, people claiming, oh, I lost a relative, I lost victims, I'm in search for, for someone, that's um, a standard. Here, again, yes, it's not a movie, but it's also not Syria. This is two things glued together, totally unrelated. This is a bombing uh, um, in, in, in the Gaza Strip um, some years ago from the, from the two tents, and the other picture is from Mosul. But look at the, um, at the, at the reach there. You have six figures added up for likes and retweets, so you can easily think that this was exposed to millions of people who believed that. Same in every situation, the Portland shooting in, um, in, two th in, in, in January, the perpetrator here, was, it was, there was, there was an, an obvious um, attempt from right-wing groups to associate him with left-wing groups, so there was a, a picture out here with him supposedly wearing an Antifa anti-fascist uh, shirt, not true. Um, and then finally, not only in terror situations, but also in, in whatever kind of disaster situation, this is supposed to be the Houston airport until it isn't. Yeah? So, coming back to journalists, as a journalist, you need to be quick. It was too quick even. Yeah. Probably... Okay, now oh. we're going <laughs> again. Yes, she is a news reporter, but she's also an actress, so this is also not true. But it comes up every time there's a hurricane or something, it's, it's going out there. So again, back to my connection line. As a journalist, you need to be quick. And with Truly, we hope to give you back a bit of that speed that you need, especially in breaking news mm -hmm. situations. I will go down two examples, three examples, based on screenshot, as that this is not a full-blown demo, but you see the core uh, features of the platform. Uh, this is the name, Truly Media. And again, let's start with false uh, tweets. Um, on the left, you see something from the Las Vegas shooting saying, okay, this is the guy they singled out as the perpetrator. On the right-hand side, you see a photo of German international Mesut Özil, um, who was not anywhere near there, but is supposed to be a victim of that. So just to see how distorted everything is, let's focus on the photo on the, on the left side. Um, this, if you feed it into, into the social media, uh, into a truly media platform, 
you would immediately get trigger a reverse image search. And as I said, this is an easy target example to show you how it goes. But anyone not familiar with, with that photo would immediately see, hey, it has been used on the internet many times. And it has been used two years ago, five years ago. And so that's an, that's an easy decision. On the other hand, it will give you immediately, just when you, when you upload that into the, into the platform directly from Twitter, there's an API, so you can search. Um, it will give you information about the source. So here you see, as I said, it's an easy target. Here you see the source. You see the tweet activity of that account. It's not a person even, of that account for the past weeks and months. And you immediately see here on, the, on, your, uh, on your left side, um, that account is on a list of bots and trolls. Yeah? Thank God, and I think Vincent will go into that. There are many fact-checking initiatives. We try to interface with them. We try to bring that knowledge into the tool so you have a lot of lists where whenever a certain keyword, a name, an account pops up, you get immediate information. Is that a bot, a troll, or someone known to spread uh, false information? Second example, London, there was a bombing. I tried to focus not, maybe not also on the big stuff, but our newsroom keeps getting stuff from over, all over the world where, where incidents might have happened or not. There was a, a bombing in, uh, in, a, in a metro station, I think that was back in, in September. No casualties, but we got this picture claiming here, this is um, the backpack before it exploded. But then you could see by the timestamp of the photo that the photo was taken after the bomb exploded. So, as I said, these are easy targets, but um, it's the kind of information that you want in a breaking news situation, desperately. So, um, third and last example, again, something that didn't make the big news, but here was a tweet, if you have these alerts going on shootings and, and stuff, there was someone claiming there has been a shooting on a parking lot in a, in a Walmart in Colorado. Again, you get that profile and this, A, it looks like a quite credible source, lots of activity, many followers, verified uh, account. And then um, it gives you the position of that, of that photo and integrated is uh, Google Maps and you can, with Street View, verify if this building that is depicted on the photo is actually in that location. So these are the core features it's a bit of technical support. The most important still is what you see here as a kind of checklist because this is a structured, project, uh, um, structured process. We developed this from journalists, for journalists. It's been done with the verification people and the experts from our newsroom. So what we have is you go through a structured process, you get some technical support along the way with the tools that are available. Uh, on top of Google Maps, you get some weather information from, uh, from Wolfram Alpha. You're connected with fact-checking sites like snoops.com and stuff, so you, you can very well relate. But maybe the most important um, feature for Truly is the collaboration. You can invite anyone of your colleagues, experts in the region, experts on the topic, uh, uh, proficient with the language spoken, into the verification process, and you're always kind of connected. Rem imagine this like, a, like, be, like you're being connected on Slack or something. You verify together on one item, and you're always aware of the verification process until finally, and for the editor in charge, you will finally see verified. Yes, I can use, and I have even permission to do this, or probably false or definitely false. So that is a, um, um, a product for the newsroom helping you especially in breaking news situations, but you can do your whole verification work as more features evolve with Truly Media. And we have a case to prove it now, because this is, and that's maybe the bad news, it's a product. Uh, it's, uh, it's out there to be, to be licensed, because we co-developed that with a, with a software partner, which is not public media, but they want to get some, um, some licenses out there. Since January, Amnesty International <coughs> sorry, is our first customer. Amnesty International, no, it's not a media organization, but it employs the largest verification um, unit and team that I know of, 80 people throughout the globe working now with Truly Media 
to verify things on social media and even document it because Amnesty very frequently takes people to trial for spreading misinformation. So that's a big step for us, a very big step um, technology-wise, but also, say, in terms of, of outreach. We're very proud. Finishing off, all this was the result of a research project funded by the European Union called Reveal. We're still doing EU co-funded projects, and the results will also try to fit them into these um, platforms. This is a video we have to Pope. I don't go without. I don't leave the house without this video. Look at this. <laughs> he is so amazing. I mean, it's around for, for, for quite a while. Many may have, may have seen this. But from this, you see, you see an imminent need for, yes, on top of uh, photos and tweets and stuff, we need video verification desperately. And INVIT, uh, a very nice name, INVIT is an abbreviation for In Video Veritas. Ah, oh. this is how sorry, I, I didn't come up with that. It was, uh, actually, actually, it's a non-cliché, our French partner from AP, he came up with that in video veritas. So, they're working on video verification. The idea is, again, to have a, um, a system maybe like Truly, a stuff that might be integrated. And then finally, as I said, there are stuff to be licensed. This is uh, what's for free. It's a plugin that you can find on invitproject.eu, and it helps you in video verification. It does automated reverse image search, and um, yeah, stuff that comes in very handy if you look at videos. It, it gives you um, keyframes and stuff. So do look out for Invit uh, video verification plugin. That's it for me. If you want to see where we are, we have a blog uh, at DW Innovation and we Twitter as at DW Innovation. And sorry, I have to do this because the moment I saw it from a British comedian, comedian said, if you want to follow me, this is how I look from behind. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Wilfred. Thank you. And, uh, and there will be a chance to ask questions and, and, and talk more to Wilfred on stage here um, in a little while. And thanks for changing my okay. image of the Pope. Uh, that Significantly. Was, uh, yeah, he, he comes out as a much more uh, uh, pleasant guy after seeing this. So uh, we're going to move on to Google now. Um, Vincent Ryan is uh, a fellow at the, the Google News Initiative, um, Google News Lab in London, and he's going to take us through uh, a series of other tools that uh, have been developed there. Vincent. Just see, are we going to come up? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hi, um, my name is Vincent Ryan. I'm from Google News Lab. Um, so Google News Lab is a division of Google um, that works with journalists. So everyone who, has, who works at Google News Lab is or was a journalist, and we have all spent time in newsrooms. Um, so we like to see ourselves as the voice of journalism within Google. So, oh, this is five seconds. There we go. So Google's mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally acceptable. So Google's 20 years old this year, and uh, this continues to be our mission. But as we all know, journalists have had this mission for a lot longer. And basically, you all have huge experience in taking masses of information and trying to make it accessible to everyone. What I'm going to try and talk to you about today are tools just to make your life a little bit easier. So I'm not going to focus too much on verification, because I think that's been thoroughly covered. I'm just going to try help with sourcing stories and to make everything more efficient. So we're going to start with just talking about News Lab. So this is Google News Lab. So what we like to do is we split journalism into our four pillars. We have trust and misinformation, our trust and verification. Then we have data journalism, we have inclusive journalism, and we have emerging technologies. I'm mainly going to talk about data journalism and emerging technologies today. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start with some tools. We're going to start very, very basic, and we're going to work up to the extremely high end. So these are some of our tools. Um, I assume you're familiar with everything that's on the screen behind me. Can you name some of them? Sheets, maps. Sheets, maps. There's loads of them. Um, most of these have a journalistic application, and I'll go through a few of them. 
If you want more information on the tools and how to use them in a journalistic context, we have our website, which is g.co forward slash newslab. Our website looks like this. It has five pillars, including the four I mentioned and one more. And on it, there are courses. So these courses here will take you through all the tools and how to use them. It says there, investigative reporting, nine lessons. It should take 92 minutes. I think the record is 12 minutes. So these don't take that long. If there's nothing on Netflix, you could do much worse than go through these. So we're going to start with some research tools. Um, why do I have research as the main slide? Before you tell any story in journalism, you have to research it. And probably the most powerful research tool in the world is... <laughs> it's Google, yeah. So we're going to start at the very, very basics. So this is Google search alerts. I used to work on the business desk of the Sunday Times. And we used to have our first weekly news conference at 11 o'clock on a Tuesday morning. At 11 o'clock on Tuesday morning, you had to have a bag full of stories that you could pitch to your editor. I used to have my search alerts set up. I would have bond numbers, funds, companies, business people, all around the world, everywhere, and I would get an email at 9 o'clock on Tuesday morning. That email was like I had digested the whole of the internet, and I could then turn around to my boss and be like, what about this story, what about this story? And he would say, generally, no. <laughs> But eventually, you'd get to a yes. But this is a really, really powerful tool. Once you have it set up and you've configured it, it doesn't kill your inbox. So it can recognize if it's the same story being repeated by multiple outlets. And you'll just get one alert with all the different outlets stacked. You can also configure it at what time you want to receive the email and how often you want to get it. Once you do that, this will actually deliver stories. You will get court cases in the Bahamas that you didn't know were happening. You will get things from Turkey. If you work in a local um, outlet, in a local radio station or a local publisher, if you put in just the towns, just the phrase from or born in, you will find local stories that are happening in other parts of the world. I cannot stress this enough. Just take the time to set this up. It's the only tool that I guarantee you will deliver you a story. So this is going to be really, 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 really basic first. but. If you bear it in mind that when you use these in conjunction, they get quite powerful. So very simply, if you put a word in inverted commas, Google only looks for that, for that phrase. So to be or not to be, or I have a dream, instead of it looking for every single instance of all the words, it just looks for the complete phrase. This is slightly more advanced. If you were to Google, obviously, I work in the UK, so my example is from the UK. I have Austrian examples later on, but we'll get to them. Um, but if you were to Google impact of UK airport expansion, all your results are going to be about Heathrow, because all the talk is about Heathrow building a third runway. But if you are not interested in Heathrow, if you put a little minus sign in front of Heathrow, Google removes Heathrow from the searches. And you get all results that do not include Heathrow. This is where it gets really, really powerful. So ISS is the International Space Station, which is over here. And if you put site semicolon nasa.gov. So site semicolon just tells Google to search within a site. So it just narrows the funnel down. So it, you can combine all of these together. So file semicolon, again, that gives you a file type. So PDF there means that Google will only search for PDFs. So I used to spend an awful lot of time reading company reports and government reports. And a lot of time, it took a lot of time to find those. But if you combine, if you know the site that it's on, you know there's a phrase that's in that one, you can put the phrase in inverted commas, put in the site, and put in the file type. Generally, people only publish things in PDFs and XLSs. This will save you about 20 minutes when you're doing research, or it could save you hours if you can't find the, the correct one. It'll just quickly find you the exact report that you want. So this is where we're going to move on into kind of slightly larger, more interesting. This is the newer tool. Um, so this is some data journalism. Um, and basically, this is Google Trends. Are you familiar with Google Trends? Yeah. Uh, so Google Trends is huge. It's 3 billion searches a day, 1.3 trillion a year. It's actually the largest data set known to mankind. We have a public tool now which allows you to access Google Trends. So the data, what's really, really, really interesting about the data on Google Trends is the level of honesty that's involved. People don't lie when they Google something. They literally put in what they want to find. 
They ask Google questions they would never ask their wife. So this is the kind of data that you can have access to. So I just thought we'll just have a quick look at an example. So we're all at radio days. So this is radio days. And basically, when you put in a search term, you put it in here. I put set the country to Austria. And in the past seven days, and you can see the spikes in interest in radio days. And you can see that all of the searches for radio days are coming from Vienna. And the related search queries are Radio Days Europe. So this can be used to find stories, because you can find it about anything. You can narrow down to country level. In the US, you can go to uh, city level, but not in the EU. Um, so this, I thought this was just a good example of um, people being honest. Um, so Sebastian Kurtz, am I pronouncing that correctly? He's the chancellor um, of Austria. Uh, and this is over all time. The, interest in searches, which has spiked since he kind of rose to prominence in, when was that, 2017. But what's interesting is the related queries. So people are not interested in his politics or, or anything like that. What they want to know is, who's his girlfriend? Which I think is really, really interesting. So that's Sebastian Kurtz's uh, friend. And if you narrow it down, you can actually find out who his girlfriend is. Oh, we don't have. Mm. Oh, it's disappeared. Maybe go one day. Oh no, it's it's updated. It was Charlotte somebody from uh, an industrialist. But to show kind of some examples of the uses of this data and how up to date it is. So this is a more heartening example. So this is in the wake, minutes after the uh, Nepalese earthquake. This was people Googling, how can we help Nepal? And this just shows it coming in from all over the world. Uh, this just shows kind of interest over time. So selfie sticks, they didn't exist before 2014. And then there was a massive spike in them. Uh, Monopod was a rival product to selfie stick that was launched. And it just didn't take off. But initially, people were trying to use that. And this is, you can narrow it down to the countries. So this is basically using this data in real time. So this was over the course of the French presidential election debate. And you can see which of the candidates are being Googled over as the debate goes on. And you make a nice horse, horse race graph, and it's really, really interactive. And we have, it's down to three minutes is the granularity of the data. And that can all be taken down and put onto something like this, which makes it really interactive. Um, this is the most common usage of trends data. So this was questions about the referendum and party leaders in the UK. And they're not the big issues. What people are interested in is how tall is Nigel Farage? And who is he married to? So we have people who work for us who are called trends curators. And they go in and they can pull out the raw data. So they can pull out questions about any given topic. And there is a Dutch radio station. Is there anyone from 538 here? So every time this radio station has a celebrity in, they get the 10 most Google questions about that celebrity. And then they make a page where they ask them the 10 most Google questions. And then they do a full page of the responses. And it's really, it's really, really popular. Um, and it's just a very good kind of actionable thing you can do. Um, this is the rhythm of food. So this required a degree of coding, and it was done with a um, yeah, it was done with an American publication called Truth and Beauty. So it just charts the interest of any food stuff over the course of the year. So as you can see, in January, everyone is frantically googling diet, and in December, no one cares. It just charts and falls over the year. So it's very interesting the data that Google, like the Google Trends, can reveal. We have our Google Trends Twitter account, where we put out um, these cards every day about the mo most searched things um, about a given topic. So that was about a football match. And then we published the raw data on our GitHub, which is Google Trends um, github.io forward slash data. Um, so we're going to, what we've been talking about here essentially is data. And you get to a point with data where there's too much for any human to handle, and it gets too large. So, this is kind of coming into the quite futuristic stuff, which is artificial intelligence and machine learning within newsrooms. 
So this is, there's only one or two newsrooms really globally who can do this kind of stuff, but it's where a lot of people think investigative journalism is going and where the future is going. Google itself, it sees itself as an artificial um, intelligence company. So machine learning and artificial intelligence are basically going to change the world, is what Sundar, our CEO, likes to say. And this is the chart of usage of machine learning within Google and within the Google tools. So if you have been using the Google tools, you have been using artificial intelligence. And one of the tools that I find journalists are quite interested in is the development of uh, our... We lost. So, ah, there we go. So the development of our voice typing, which has basically changed how some journalists like to work. So this has been um, development of natural language processing, which means the thing that I hated most being a journalist was listening back to um, my interviews, because I had to listen to myself talking. So this, if you've done an interview somewhere quiet, it will transcribe it for you. What this does not do is it does not punctuate or sub your work. But it's a very handy tool in getting raw copy in. And it's powered entirely by artificial intelligence. Um, and that's basically in Drive and tools and very easy to set up. But we're now going into the world where we're attempting to develop tools with machine learning and AI at the heart of them that can be used in any newsroom. At the moment, we only have one or two examples. So this is huge, huge data, which is all of the global fishing data. And each of the goal, goal spots is GPS data from a fishing boat. And fishing is huge. So this is the uh, Chinese fishing fleet heading out to sea after a three-month ban. And you can just basically see that's a real photo. This is the number of fishing ships that go out. So because the data is so large, it's very hard for traditional journalists to sift it through it all and find the news story. So the ICIJ, who won the Pulitzer Prize for publishing the Panama Papers, they attempted to go through all of the phishing data after FOIing huge amounts of location data and the fish catches from different countries and trying to figure out how much illegal fishing was going on. It was a manual process and it took forever. This has now been automated. So using GPS data from ships and Google Cloud, Google's now able to analyze the movements of each of the ships, and then they can analyze the type of fishing that's being done and where it's being done. So this is a huge, huge amount of data, but it's being done programmatically. And this has actually led to prosecutions for illegal fishing. So this is Kirkrabati, which is one of the smallest countries in the world, and the first illegal prosecution they ever secured was due to the data that was collected from the Global Fishing Watch. Um, similarly, BuzzFeed took a huge trove of international data, which was all of the flight data, and they used artificial intelligence to um, figure out which flights had been registered and which flights had not been registered, and they were able to identify a huge amount of illegal flights that were kind of dark, dark planes and spies. Um, ProPublica have been using artificial intelligence to sift through all of the news that's on Google News Feed, so the raw news to identify trends within hate crime, and it can pull it out so it's the type of person, the location where it happened, and that just pulls all news and allows them to see a kind of step back picture of what's happening within the world. Um, similarly, this was a huge project which analyzed all of basically cinema, and then it the screen time that women had compared to men, and then the talking time that women had compared to men to show the gender bias that had exists in cinema. And it was done programmatically, and the results were actually shocking. Uh, and I think that's kind of led to a bit of a change. And the final one we have is Jigsaw, which is one of Google's um, companies. So it's uh, one of the Alphabet companies. And they've released this new tool, which is public, um, and any publisher can use it, which helps with the moderation of comments. If you're familiar with the internet, the comments section is never a pleasant place to be. But this basically can detoxify comments. It, it's an aid to a human moderator. It's not a complete moderator on our own, but it can highlight when things are not what they should be. Um, Vice has also been using it for translate, but that's kind of uh, an aside. Um, and basically, the final thing is, 
This is work that's still in progress, particularly the artificial intelligence and the machine learning. This is never going to replace journalists, because while computers are very, very good at answering questions, they're absolutely terrible at asking them. So identifying what the right questions are to ask, that remains the journalist's job. And then the tools are now at our disposal to do huge investigations. So I'd like you to go away and think about what can be done. Thank you, Vincent. And, and Let's pick up on, uh, on that note. What, I suspect that most of you here are journalists and, and, and working with journalism in, in radio. What are the challenges that you're facing and what are the uh, initiatives that could be really helpful in your work uh, for Google or for others to, uh, to, ve to, to develop tools to, to handle? I suspect there's a microphone over there. So it's re looking really, really good for the future of radio journalism. All problems and challenges have been handled so far. Is that? Was there a hand over here? There was not a hand over there. Okay, let me just ask you while you while you think it through, um, Vincent. So when you type in a certain sentence or word that you want to to search in, in Google Trends, how can you make sure that what you um, are met with is actually truthful? That it is not something that other other, um, other media has put out that is not uh, trustworthy? Uh, well, so, so Google Trends is, it is it's, it's not a reflection of what exists, it's a reflection of the interest of people. So there is no manipulation to that. Uh, it, 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 it's a mirror, essentially, to society, because what it shows is what people are interested in. Um, so that really cannot be manipulated, other than by manipulating of mass society. Mm -hmm. But are there filters in Google in the, in, in the search engine that make sure that what we are met with when we do a variety of searches well, is, is trustworthy? So within, within Google search itself, we have the news vertical. And within the news vertical, um, everything that appears there is from trusted publishers. Um, and also, there's no advertising is ever put against the news, uh, the, the news vertical. And a huge effort is put into making sure that everyone we work with and who appears in that is completely reliable and um, of an established credibility. Uh, what are, what are, at, at Deutsche Welle, Wilfred, what, what is the next project that you're going to, to work on? Are you going to elaborate more on, 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 on Truly, or yes. what are your sites? Yeah, I mean, I mean, Truly, uh, I, I tried to, to show just bits and pieces of, of what could be enhancements to Truly, as we see now a need for to go deeper into video verification. Um, that is definitely uh, one of the projects. But then the examples that, that Vincent show are of high relevance, as you can imagine, to an uh, international broadcaster. For us, for example, language um, and bringing content from one language to the other or working with a multilingual uh, workforce is a huge uh, effort. And uh, say one of, one of or, or actually we have two projects that are dealing with human language technologies and the way you can imply them now. I mean, the, the speech to text example uh, from, from Google is a nice one, but you get these services now. Uh, you, yeah. you can choose for the best quality in language pairs. So um, yeah, we're building a platform, actually another um, DNI project. It's called Newsbridge. And, and we we focusing on core languages uh, now, so the well-established language pairs, where we want um, nothing short of, say, automatic subtitling, yes. In how many languages? <coughs> uh, we're starting with four. Four? Yeah. Very good. So you were making this invitation, Vincent, to, you know, what, what, what is it really that journalists need help to, 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 to research? Uh, what, there, is a, there is a fund, the Digital News Initiative at, at Google. What are the the applications uh, that, that you're getting there, what is it, do you have an overview? What are the, what are the main issues that journalists are asking for help to, well, so to the, solve? Well, the, the DNI has different calls, so sometimes they will do a call around monetization, sometimes they do calls around investigations. There have been some interesting projects. There is Full Facts have developed a tool which does um, real-time. That's the UK fact finding. It's, yeah, the UK website. fact finding. And they have a tool which I don't think they've publicly released yet, but they have demoed it which um, does audio in real time, and it, it can identify when people use statistics, 
and then it can pair, pairs those statistics in real time to the statistics body and can verify whether or not that is correct. You so a politician is saying something in a, in a, in a say, political debate, and it's, it's recording that sound and, and measuring it up against what is uh, available of numbers so, yeah, on so the internet. Similar to, to what I showed with the voice to text, it works in a similar manner where it, it takes what the politician says, converts it to text, takes the text and compares the text to existing verified um, facts, essentially. Um, and it can, in real time, basically say if that was a correct figure or not. But a that is still figure. a rumor that that tool is available. Uh, I have seen it. Um, in action, and it, it worked, and yeah. it was um, very impressive. Um, I think it works very well with established things like statistics, whereby it's a raw figure. Um, like, there is nuance in everything, so I'm not sure how it would work on a That's going to be a big leap forward. That's one of the things that I've experienced myself, that, that fact-checking statistics is really one of the big challenges, because it's so, it needs so much human thinking in order to make sure that you find the right numbers and... Uh, well, there's, there's huge issues with the use of statistics generally in, in journalism, like things like sample sizes, and uh, whether or not people are uh, looking for bias and things like that. Like, if you look at the failures of forecasting in all of the recent large elections, like, that is essentially a statistics failing. Um, and I don't know how you correct for that. <laughs> Okay, we'll, we'll leave that uh, for... There is a question here. We, we're, we're running out of time, but uh, let's celebrate that. We do have a question. There's a question over there. Things are running wild now. Yes, go. Please go ahead. Uh, <laughs> so right now, fake news and audio, uh, uh, apart from statistics that people misuse, isn't really a problem because audio kind of doesn't go viral. There's no Macedonian teenagers. Did you hold the microphone? Yeah. There's no Macedonian teenagers trying to make fake news on audio, but that's not to say it won't be a problem in the future. I've seen some demos of researchers who have taken 100 hours of President, only 100 hours of President Obama speaking, which is really nothing at all, and made a text-to-speech voice. And mm -hmm. when you know that it's <coughs> that this exists, you, you can tell the differences in intonation, but that's not to say, you know, technology gets better over time so quickly. Is this something that you're worried about? Because 100, of, 100 hours of someone speaking really isn't very much, and eventually it could be as little as four or three, two. Yeah, um, yeah actually, I, I am worried because, again, because of tech, uh, progress of, of technology, there's actually a, a project which is not a, a product yet, from Adobe, it's called Adobe Voco or Project Voco. That only needs 20 hours of, uh, of sample material and it will uh, mimic, uh, it will speak any sentence that you type in and the, that you want that voice to, uh, to speak. So uh, audio being your only cue for, is, a, is, is does person X, Y, Z has really said that is, uh, is a real dangerous, uh, say, um, means to, to, to distort uh, the truth because, because you only have the audio to rely on and then if, if, if someone sounds like President Obama and he says this incredible stuff and it's on, on tape or it's recorded, uh, then you're very likely to, to believe that. You, you need other cues and you definitely need uh, verification. And let me have one sentence uh, which is important uh, to me because yes, we're talking technology and technology also and truly does a tremendous, tremendous job to help yeah. journalists, to support journalists. We, but also the platforms, will need experts in verification and journalists galore to get rid of what is happening now. So technology, yes, but journalism and journalists on equal footing with some technology support. Thank you. There is still a need for us. Thank you so Thank much, you. Wilfried Ronde of Deutsche Welle and, and Vincent Ryan of uh, the Google News Lab. Sorry to the gentleman in the back who didn't get time to ask his question. Thank you, everyone. And let me just, before you leave for lunch, which is the next uh, um, point on the agenda, uh, make a short uh, advertisement for the podcast day, the uh, Radio Days Europe podcast day, which is going to be held in Copenhagen. Wonderful Copenhagen. I can only recommend my, my capital. 12th of June, uh, an entire day on podcasting, 12th of June in Copenhagen. Hear you there. See you there. Have a great lunch, and thank you for now. <laughs>